welcome everyone. Um, I want to mention that the League of Women Voters of the United States is a nonpartisan voter education organization encouraging informed, active participation in government. It's the League's position that voting is a fundamental citizen right that must be guaranteed. Our programs will not necessarily represent League positions, but the League wants to provide forums for community members and experts to educate about the various topics important to democracy. Before we begin, we have this important announcement. The League of Women Voters of Washtenaw County reminds you that we and the League of Women Voters of Michigan strongly oppose the Secure My Vote petition drive. The Secure MI Vote ballot initiative affects everyone's voting rights. Here are only a few of the ways. It eliminates the affidavit option if you don't meet ID requirements at the polls. It mandates that people disclose partial social security numbers when registering to vote, creating an identity theft risk. It bans funds from nonprofits to help local election officials administer the elections. And if adopted, it is referendum proof. Michigan voters will not be able to repeal it. This is an urgent matter. You can find out more at lwvmi.org and where you can also read the press release about the League of Michigan stance. We will post this in the chat as well. Um, do not sign the secure MI vote petition and please circulate this information to everybody you know, it is essential. And that's it, it's my pleasure now to introduce my friend, the League uh, Lunch and Learn moderator, Shelley Shanfield. Okay, thank you, Teresa. In the communities found in the 8217 zip code, toxic chemicals from steel production, coal-fired power plants, smokestacks, a salt mine, a wastewater treatment plant, and one of the nation's largest oil refineries pollute the air and ground. This extreme pollution results in high rates of asthma, cancer, brain damage, respiratory diseases, birth defects, and cognitive impairments. This has earned 48217 the unenviable title of the most polluted zip code in Michigan, where visitors are forced to mask up against the smell that inhabitants have to live with almost daily. Part of 48217's tragedy is that this area was once a thriving Black community. It did not have the racially restrictive covenants in the 1950s and 60s that most of Detroit and indeed many parts of the country had. Um, Motor City's auto industry drew many of the tens of thousands fleeing the Jim Crow South. And among these thousands, many moved into the modest bungalows of what was called the Tri-Cities, which is uh, River Rouge, Ecorse, and Southwest Detroit. The ability to own property made it a prosperous black working class community with black owned grocery stores, restaurants, hotels, banks, pharmacies, flower shops, car dealers, and even a hospital. But by the mid 1960s, growth of industry and the construction of I-75 split 48217 in half, plowing under orchards and gardens to construct a highway that now is used by over 100,000 cars and diesel powered semi-trucks a day, adding nitrogen oxide, particulate matter, carbon monoxide, benzene, and other harmful emissions to the industrial pollution, especially from the Marathon oil refinery. During a 50 year period, the refineries in size has increased to encompass 250 acres, and it now produces up to 140,000 barrels of oil a day, pumping out hundreds of tons of nitrous oxide, sulfur dioxide, and carbon monoxide. Today, despite promises that the refinery would add jobs and economic opportunity to the area, only 41 of its 524 employees live in Detroit. Our speaker today, Dr. Gavin Edwards will describe Detroit as a city with a long history of diversity and how federal, state, and local policies have marginalized many groups over the years. He will discuss the environmental movement and how air quality is everyone's concern and how these two issues are linked in the 48217 zip code. It has prompted some citizens who have experienced directly the illnesses that result from pollution from neighboring industries 
industries to become activists working to inform the public about the lack of environmental justice for the community. Dr. Edwards was born in South Wales, UK, and received his PhD in atmospheric chemistry from the University of Leicester, UK. He did postdoctoral research work at the National Center for Atmospheric Research in Boulder, Colorado, and Purdue University. Currently an associate professor in the Department of Chemistry, Eastern Michigan University, he is part of a research group that measures both air quality and the factors that influence it. His group is passionate about analyzing the quality of the air all citizens are exposed to, both in the Detroit urban corridor and around the state of Michigan. They're engaged in ongoing efforts to build long-term data sets on how ozone and other gases are changing in concentration due to climate change, legislative policies, and other factors. Welcome, Dr. Edwards. Thank you so much, Shelley, for that uh, most generous uh, introduction. And I really want to thank everyone again for extending such a generous invitation to me uh, today. Um, I really, it's my pleasure to be here. Um, your colleague and friend, Vicki Paulson, reached out to me about coming and, and giving a presentation. And I thought, what a perfect opportunity to come and talk to you about some of the issues of environmental justice that uh, this community has, I guess, struggled with over the last few years and to kind of highlight their plight and also um, kind of Put it into a larger context and we'll really start focusing on I guess three distinct parts of my presentation today. The one is we'll talk about a little bit about the history of the city, um, we'll talk a little bit about a history of the environmental movement and then see how these two factors kind of gel together in this such a unique zip code. So as I say let's think about this this kind of topic then in really three I guess separate segments and then we'll kind of bring them together at the end. So there's been a lot of media attention on the city of Detroit, and the reason why is, of course, Detroit has had its fair share of struggles over the last few decades. And also, it's one of the most important metropolitan areas in the United States because it is majority minority. And when we deal with issues like environmental justice, then the city of Detroit has been one of the major focuses on the environmental justice movement. And the environmental justice movement is, of course, I'm sure you know, the idea that everybody, no matter what your background, what your race, what um, your creed, your identity, uh, you all subject to the same environmental laws and you should all have a same right in those laws. And so what we're gonna do is explore the issues of environmental justice from the point of view of that one unique zip code, that zip code 48217. So before we kind of look at that zip codes per se, I wanna kind of get an idea of the history of Detroit in terms of how it came to be such a diverse city. And so the history of Detroit really is a history of diversity. Now, of course, some sure if you look at the Detroit Historical Society, and they've been very useful in, um, in their archives in, in, very, in kind of getting me the information I needed to kind of flesh out my presentation today. And so a lot of the Detroit Historical Society documents that you can review tell you a lot about the city, especially in its history. For example, um, Detroit was founded all the way back in 1701 by our friend, uh, Mr. Antoine uh, Cadillac. And I guess Monsieur should be the pr proper uh, moniker for this gentleman because he was a French military leader and trader. And over the next 50 years, Detroit remained a very small frontier town. The only reason why people might visit Detroit were if you were a fur trader or a trapper and you're kind of moving into the, uh, the Michigan hinterland because Detroit was a small frontier post. It only was about the size of a city block. And it remained a French settlement until after uh, the British takeover in 1760 following the, the conclusion of the French Indian War. And even close to the American Revolution, Detroit was a very small town. It was only about 1,400 people called it their home when our friend, um, you know, John Adams and, and Paul Revere were making a noise over in Boston. And so the colonies in New England were getting the attention. Detroit was just another speck on the map, which was often overlooked by most people. However, that was about to change because in the 19th century, the United States and specifically Detroit itself, there was a large amount of immigration into the neighborhood and into the new city. Of course, the talking about immigrations from Europe, the great wave of immigrations from uh, Europe into the United States, specifically in the 19th century. So this wonderful timeline um, created from the Destroyed Historical Society, which I was able to uh, kind of use and recreate, it really tells you that story about different waves of immigrants from different countries moving from their point of origin to the great city of Detroit and really establishment of that city. So for example, in 1830, the first wave of Irish immigrants began to arrive. They started settling sort of the area of Woodward Avenue and they called their neighborhoods Corktown. 
Scandinavian immigrants started to appear in the city around about 1850. 1855, a large wave of Italian immigrants started moving in Detroit, specifically on the east side of the city. 1857, the Polish wave of immigrants started arriving. And by 1870, Detroit's numbers of people uh, who called that city their home swelled to almost 80,000. And about half of the people who were now called Detroit their home were born in a different country. So large waves of immigration meant that, of course, large waves of this migrant population started setting up. But as you see from the timeline, they started to set up in, in sort of almost different sort of, I guess, little islands. Most people, when they move to a new place, you want to uh, move to an area that you might identify with the neighborhood or the people that live in that community. And so they started to congregate in these uh, certain areas. And by about 1880, Detroit's population was over 115,000. It was a very multicultural city. 40 different nationalities were represented. And by the turn of the, uh, the 19th into the 20th century, Detroit was actually the 13th largest city in the United States. So we went from a, almost a hamlet of about 1,400 one century later then Detroit is about 285,000 people. Now, of course, the 19th and the 20th century call the massive explosion of Detroit's population, not only in terms of the immigrant wave that we saw from Europe that we, we kind of just touched on on the previous slide, but also, of course, in following the conclusion of the Civil War and the Great Emancipation, then people starting to move away from their ancestral homes in the South. And if you're an African-American, then maybe Detroit would be a place that you might want to go. Now, this is what we now call, the, of course, the Great Migration. And so a lot of people who were newly freed in uh, the southern part of the United States trying to escape, as we talked about um, in the introduction, the Jim Crow laws, then they wanted to move out of those um, traditional areas that their ancestors might have been brought over as slaves. Now they gained their freedom. They wanted to move perhaps to pastures new. And so I'll come back to the slide in a moment. But here I have um, a picture that really shows what the Great Migration was doing when people started moving out from the old antebellum south. People started moving in sort of three great tracks. A lot of African-Americans were looking to make their fortune out west in, in um, the new states of California, Nevada. And also, of course, they wanted to go to the more traditional established neighborhoods that existed on the eastern seaboard. But there was that third migration that went to the Midwest. And so a large African-American population started now influxing into cities like Chicago, Cleveland, and of course, Detroit. So about one fifth of Detroit's population was composed of immigrants of some kind by the first half of the 20th century. Now, of course, the reason why people migrate from one place to another, quite often it is an economic um, motivation. And so a lot of the people started moving out um, of the South or even just moving to a better life in the United States because there was good jobs there. So for example, if we look at the automotive industry that had been established by Henry Ford over in Dearborn, you know, in, at the end of the 19th century, and by the 20th century's turn, the industrialization of Detroit and the kind of revolutions that Ford and uh, his cohorts were undergoing in the city really started getting a lot of immigrants very attracted to kind of move to those areas. They could start then not only uh, working in the factories, but also, of course, they were supporting businesses. And so a lot of people started establishing businesses, a lot of immigrant businesses from the first generation of, of European immigrants, and of course, now African-American immigrants. So that resulted in a large explosion in terms of only the population of Detroit, but also kind of thinking about the physicality, how big the city was starting to get. And so about 81 square miles of urban land was now classed as the city of Detroit between uh, right after um, World War I. And so if you kind of think about that in terms of a population, then the population now ballooned up to 460,000. And then even up until 1930, it continued to boom. It was really a big boom town and the population of Detroit by 1930 was about 1.5 million people. About 75% of this were either immigrants or first generation Americans. So a city of diversity. Now, of course, there's always issues when people migrate from one place to another. Many jobs that were available to um, immigrants were high paying in factories, but also ones that kind of moved tangentially uh, in that area as well, because they started establishing businesses and then a business will support another business. But in terms of housing, it was much more difficult to kind of sort of pick and choose where you wanted to live. Now, this was partly by design. People tend to congregate together, as we talked about before. If you're an Irish immigrant, then you might want to live in the Irish neighborhood. If you're an African-American immigrant, you might want to live with other African-Americans. That's just human nature. But also, there was various racial policies, especially for the African-American community, which really limited where they could move. And so most black residents, when they moved into the city of Detroit, 
Then they were congregated in the Paradise Valley or Black Bottoms neighborhood on the east side of Detroit. Now, part of it, as I said, was kind of self-selection, but also it, part of it was a racial uh, bias by the Housing Commission. And so if you kind of think about it in the 1930s, then we just emerged from the Great Depression, money was tight and lenders, especially mortgage lenders, were very selective about where they wanted to give you money in order to have a home. And so this discriminative practice became known as the notorious practice of quote redlining. Now this is a term that we even use today, but redlining really was an actual legitimate thing. And so I wanna show you and keep in mind that, that picture on the top right there, we're gonna kind of come back to that in a moment. Now in the 1930s, the Homeowners Loan Corporation, they set out to advantage mortgage lending risk in the United States. They wanted to give money to certain uh, residents and have them repay their loan, have good, um, a good uh, loan that they knew would be repaid. And so what they did for almost all cities in the United States over a certain size, they started breaking down the city in terms of a color code where they said people could live. Where is most desirable to live? Neighborhoods that were kind of up and coming, neighborhoods that kind of maybe been and gone, and the neighborhoods that you didn't want to really live in. And they gave these colors. And you can find these maps online. You can find them on the internet. You can find them in historical documents. You can find them for Baltimore. You can find them in Chicago. And also, of course, you can find them for Detroit. And the color codes that the HOLC gave was green, which was highly desirable, blue, which was that's kind of okay, yellow, which was kind of a declining neighborhood, and then finally, red, which was a neighborhood to be avoided at essentially all costs. And when we look at that, kind of map here, then what we see is that compare and contrast this map with the slide that we saw previously, which I'll, I'll quickly flip back to, look at where the African-American community is. They were forced in many, off, in many cases to kind of live in the area that was so-called redlined, areas that were very undesirable to quote, good folks. And so they were, they were subjugated to already a racial discrimination. And so these people were forced to live there. And of course, these neighborhoods well, they suffered from a lot of problems, a lot of areas that kind of that, that people were forced into the predatory lending market and the cycle of poverty and insecurity really settled. So you can see this direct correlation between the red line neighborhoods and those African-American communities. It got so bad that in 1940s, then even national attention was being given to this, this process of red lining. And I want to kind of show you, and I kind of quote, I, I found that really kind of sums up in my opinion, very succinctly this practice. And so in 1941, I'll move myself, a company, a private company looking to build in the eight mile road area decided to erect a wall that would extend half a mile south of eight mile. And this was called the Biowood Wall. And it was meant to split that black community. And the community of white members were on one side and the black people were on the other. And it was as uh, quoted here by Ofo Zegwe, who's a CEO and co-founder of a website called Who's Your Landlord? And I think it distinctly says that because it says it was less of a true deterrent than more of a symbolic middle finger. It was a six foot tall cement barrier meant to signify to folks on the outside, you don't belong here. So on one side of the wall, you had the white community. On the other side of the wall, you had the black community segregated by a very distinct barrier. Now, not a barrier in terms of something that you know a, a school child could climb over, but a barrier that really is so a representation of this is one community, that is your community. You don't belong on one side of the wall, and I don't belong on the other. So in 1950s, the population of Detroit was now at its peak. It was about 1.8 million people. And in 1950 as well, we started to see federal uh, government getting involved in policies and passing policies through Congress that really affected the population of Detroit in a big way. The first and perhaps most famous, of course, is the GI Bill. You think of the end of World War II, a lot of the people who uh, served our country um, so bravely during World War II were coming home. The GI Bill passed federal loan guarantees that obviously provided a lot of money for uh, GIs to go to college, but also it did some other things as people started to get an idea of where they would like to live. And so a lot of the time then there wasn't really room for the new homes that these veterans would like to buy. In conjunction with that, the Detroit freeway system and a part of a new renewal process started to move the GIs and um, people who were buying homes and started establishing more suburban neighborhoods as we would now call them, places like Harper Woods, East Detroit, Livonia. In conjunction with that, um, President Eisenhower in 1956, of course, wanted to establish the United States interstate system and specifically 
he fund uh, through acts of Congress, they funded the construction of Interstate 75. 975 and 375 were plotted out directly along the lines of those traditional black neighborhoods that we talked about previously, Paradise Valley and Black Bottom. As a result, those neighborhoods were effectively raised to the ground. The construction of the neighborhood destroyed these uh, traditional black areas and where there was a vibrant community and a vibrant, uh, I guess, neighborhoods that had been established in order to build the city. And so this infrastructure bill that was passed through Congress, as you can see, is already directly impacting people's lives, perhaps for the good, if you're a GI, kind of now demobbed and you want to go back into civilian life, or in a negative way, if you're an African-American business owner, the federal government now says, well, your community is being destroyed. Sorry, but this is where the interstate's going to go. So I want to focus now on what happened in this kind of new constructions regarding that zip code that we're going to focus on in our third part of our presentation today, the 48217 zip code. Now, the construction of that interstate system caused this zip code and many others to kind of be cut off. We saw uh, in the wonderful introduction that was given that that Tri-Cities area was really broken up by the construction of I-75. So instead of a large neighborhood now, what you've got is almost like little island neighborhoods that are cut off from each other because of geography. You got a little island cut off then by the fact that a new interstate's like there. Another island might be cut off by the fact that you've got the Detroit River there or the River Rouge. And so that's what we see with this neighborhood, which we now call zip code 48217. The construction of the interstates combined with the natural geography of the fact that you had the River Rouge on one side and also the Detroit River on the other, kind of created an, a community that was, just, was cut off from the wider, the wider communities that it once was part of. Consequently, then the community, it can kind of, it can, can become more vibrant because the people there now feel they are really are part of a much smaller community and so they fight uh, for the community's health. But also sometimes you can see the same the same impacts, the same negative impacts on a community now being subject to, the, to those population. So we'll come back to 48217 in terms of thinking about the impact of environmental justice and air quality. But before we do that in part three, let's look at part two of our presentation today, where we're going to focus more on, well, atmospheric chemistry. I'm an atmospheric chemist and I'm um, interested in air quality. So let's talk about some of the issues of air quality in time memoriam and also now up to the present day. So how this impacted uh, 48217 was the fact that now, in conjunction with the development of the interstate system, what these people seemed to see was large and heavy industries moving into that area. And as we'll see in a minute, that has a big impact on their air quality. Because of the unique geography of 48217, then you've got the area that we talked about is in very close proximity to a railroad. It's in close proximity to the Detroit River and the River Rouge that we talked about before. So it's got really good transportation nodes. And when you're an industry, then you want to move into an area, then those are things that the, your logistics operation care about. And so we see that the neighborhood that was kind of isolated by um, the, the laws that were passed in the 1950s, now the communities are seeing a, a large influx of the heavy industries, things like steel plants, things like DTE energy plants, things like air and chemical plants, things like the Marathon Oil Refinery all opened. And so the traditional back neighborhoods, we had that vibrant community of African-American owned businesses, that community is being decimated by the constructions and also now the area is being influxed by these areas of heavy industry. Well, what's the point of heavy industry? Why would someone who lives in an area that's kind of next to heavy industry care? Well, as I say, this dovetails nicely into part two of our presentation where we need to talk about the environmental movement and air quality. So when we look back through history, then we see that air quality and what is really in the air that we breathe has been a concern for people for centuries. For example, if we go back to 600 BC, uh, then um, the Roman historians talk about the Carthaginian and Roman lead mines that were in um, the, the, what we now would call, would, we would call Spain. Those Spanish lead mines then, it rumored that slaves would fall down dead because of the black fumes and the Spanish mines would blacken the sky. And so Polybius, the Roman historian, talks about this in his histories of the Punic Wars. All the way up to the 13th century, the Middle Ages, King John of England, then he banned the burning of sea coal, which was a coal I found very close to the coastline. They would very, very easily to access, they dig it up, they'd burn this, but it produced, quote, 
foul miasmas. It's a wonderful word, and we should use miasma more in everyday conversation. Then he didn't like it because it produced a, a smell, a, a foul miasma, which polluted the air. And so he banned it. And when, when you're the king, I guess you can put your stamp on it and say, that's banned. Now, of course, when we think about air pollution in the United States, we think about California. And California, specifically Los Angeles, has been the kind of poster child for air pollution, especially in the 19th and, and, and into the 19th and 20th centuries. If you want to read about this, there's a fabulous book called Smog Town, it talks about all about the history of the air pollution in, in Los Angeles. It's a really, I guess it's a great read, especially if you're a big nerd like me. Then um, I got a lot of the facts out of that, that book. And so, for example, in 1943 was the first recorded smog that appeared over Los Angeles. This was a mixture of smoke and fog. They combined the words together. And in 1943, of course, um, the United States and the Allies were at war. And so people, one day they woke up and a strange cloud seemed to descend upon the city, caused people's eyes to stream and people's lungs to be irritated. People started coughing. Some people actually phoned the army. They phoned the police. They said the city's under attack by the Empire of Japan. It's a chemical weapons attack, but actually no, it was the first episode of LA smog, something the residents would, would certainly get used to. Right after World War II, there was a very famous disaster out in Pennsylvania, the small town of Donora, Pennsylvania, which sat in a, a bottom of a valley and had a large amount of heavy industry, manganese and um, specifically steel smelting. A unique weather event caused effectively the fumes from um, the chimneys to kind of be trapped over the town. And about half of the town's 14,000 residents experienced significant respiratory stresses and 20 people died. In 1952 was the first big soup in London, the pea super of these London fogs, and they became notorious in the 1950s due to a large amount of coal burning for people's homes being heated by coal and also by um, just industries in, in the city of London. About 6,000 to 10,000 people are estimated now to have been perished in those great smog events. And it wasn't just our West Coast thing in the United States, even if you lived in New York City in 1966, there was a big smog in New York City and that smog killed 169 people. So it was really in the 1960s that it was just such an era of transition um, for the United States. If you think about someone who um, was born in, in, in that time and, and kind of experienced this, I'm sure you guys remember um, much of it, but was it certainly a transitional time for the United States, not only in terms of political um, activity, but also think about, think about the environmental movement. It was really the birth of the environmental movement was in 1960s. All the way back in 1960, we kind of think now as the environmental movement was sort of kicked off in 1960 when Silent Spring was published by Rachel Carson. And the kind of the bookend on the decade was in summer of 1969. So um, you know, you remember the Brian Adams song, right, Summer of 69. So when you were getting ready to watch people walk on the moon and you were kind of getting ready for, to go to Woodstock or whatever, in June 1969, the Cuyahoga River in Ohio caught fire. I remember, remember hearing about this. It was like, how, how can a river catch fire? But this actually wasn't the first time it caught fire. It's caught fire many times um, throughout history. And so what happened was the large industry that was surrounding the river used the water for cooling and also basically as, a, as an open sewer to, to pump waste into. It always had a layer of oil and debris. And I now believe that um, sparks from a welder actually caught the oil and the debris set of the light. And so it was kind of nothing really that new to the people. As I said, it happened a few times, but what happened of course is a Time Magazine got a hold of the story and then they published that story and it went nationwide. And so that really gave this, this, this environmental disaster national attention. You can see a picture of the fire there in the top right. This is actually a picture from 1956, but the time, time reporters didn't report that as they reported as being the current fire. That also was bookended at the end of the decade of the 1960s by um, the publication of National Geographic magazine. Um, and so we you know every dentist and, and every doctor's office always has National Geographic, right? And on the cover of their December 1970, they had a, a picture and a, a cover story that was called Our Ecological Crisis. So really started focusing on the environmental movement. The 1960s was just an explosion of people caring about our environment and, and our planet and what human activities were doing to it. And of course, that kind of maybe the final thing was the culmination of this movement was the celebration in 1970 of the world's first birthday. Now, it wasn't only people and citizens um, like ourselves that were concerned about this, even the federal government was concerned. Now, in 1970, the federal government passed the Clean Air Act, and 
Now, in my opinion, and I'm the one biased, it is the single greatest piece of legislation that the US Congress has ever published and has ever passed into law, signed into law by President Nixon. You can see him signing the bill right there. So in 1970, the Clean Air Act was the kind of a, a, a culmination of many small acts in one big one that regulated what industry could, public, could pollute and, and, and put into our air and into our water. And it really started kind of clamping down on heavy industries in terms of their pollution and founded the Environmental Protection Agency. And so President Nixon, when he signed the bill, um, you can see him, as I say, signing it here. He signed it on December 31st, 1970. And afterwards, he took some um, questions from reporters. And of course, he famously said, I am not a crook. Well, he did say that, but that was later. Right? That, that, was, that was 1974 Watergate. Well, he was still good Nixon in this time. Uh, was he ever good? I, I don't know. Anyway, what he really said was, I think the 1970s will be known as the year of the beginning in which we really begin to move forward with the problems of clean air and clean water and open spaces for the future generations of America. So when we think of it now, it's almost kind of like, a, I guess, um, a, a, a political uh, an anathema to, to certain people might say, you know, a Republican president publishing and really championing uh, the, the Clean Air Act. And so the, his, when his, his signature, this law went into act. And as I say, in, in my opinion, it's the, it's the greatest piece of legislation ever passed just because it protected so many people in terms of their health. Oh, hopefully in the next few slides, I'll go some way to show you the impact of this wonderful piece of legislation. So what I have here is two pictures. The one is on the left is of uh, New York City in, taken in 1973. And this one on the right is taken in New York City in 2017. Now, the, sign, the, 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 the skylines of Manhattan have changed, but what I want to draw your attention to is the purple and orange and nasty haze that you can see in the air in the picture that was taken in 1973. So just uh, after the, the Clean Air Act was passed into law um, through the president's signature, then we see this kind of horrible sludge that's kind of sitting over the Manhattan skyline. Now, what you see in the foreground is the George Washington Bridge. You can see that little sailboat there. Almost exactly co-located, a picture taken in 2017, you can see the George Washington Bridge once again, but now you can see all of the buildings in the background. In the previous slide, they're kind of hidden behind that orange curtain. You can see the Manhattan skyline. You can see, you know, um, the, the World Trade Center. You can see the downtown of Manhattan very clearly right there. A, a significant impact in people's lives, just visually. But also the Clean Air Act has improved people's lives in terms of the chemistry that they're, they're, they're kind of subjected to through atmospheric uh, chemistry. Now the EPA lists uh, several molecules that they class as toxic. So when you breathe these molecules in, it is deleterious to human health. And what we see here is that we can track the trends in the chemicals that the EPA uh, legislates against. And we really see a massive improvement in all of these species. For example, we'll talk about um, what these things do to you in a moment, but carbon monoxide is down 85% from 1980 to 2016. Lead, down 99%. Nitrogen dioxide, the annual figure, down 62%. The one hour figure, down 61%. Ozone, the eight hour average of people exposed to ozone has been reduced by 30%. And sulfur dioxide reduced by about 87%. So these air toxics that are identified by the EPA, they have just plummeted due to the fact that we now have the Clean Air Act, which regulates what people can emit into the air. Fantastic piece of legislation. So why should we care? Well, these molecules, as I alluded to, are deleterious to human health. When you breathe these molecules in, it's actually hurting your health. Most of them are respiratory, uh, exacerbates respiratory issues that you might already have, or they can start new ones through prolonged exposure. For example, a molecule I really look at through my research is called ozone. Now, ozone on the ground is an EPA regulated pollutant, not ozone in the ozone layer, which you know, we know about the hole in the ozone layer. That's good ozone. I'm talking about bad ozone, which is here at the ground. Then that one is produced by chemical reactions in the air and sunlight. It causes oxidative stress in your lung tissue. It can cause shortness of breath, asthma attacks, and even death. Nitrogen dioxides, well, they irritate the human respiratory system as well. You can get asthma attacks, shortness of breath, coughing, wheezing, again, if you breathe this molecule in. Sulfur dioxide. Now, sulfur dioxide is a specifically nasty one because when you breathe that in, it makes sulfuric acid right there in your lungs. And you don't have to be a chemist to know that that is a significant uh, 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 impact on your health. 
it's particularly involving uh, children. They're very worried about people uh, who are young, exposed to, um, to SO2, then that molecule can be breathed in, it can damage uh, the lungs and also the development of lungs over time. Things like carbon monoxide, this is a molecule that you might have heard of. People sadly die through exposure to this. And every year, if you have it like a generator, uh, the power goes out and you hear a family, they were killed by carbon monoxide poisoning because they had a generator like in their basement or their garage, they didn't have enough ventilation. Basically, this molecule kind of binds with other things in your blood and reduces the blood flow to your brain. It can cause fatigue, nausea, and ultimately in high concentrations or, or exposure over long enough, it can result in confusion, dizziness, and even death. And finally, lead. Of course, we're all very familiar here in Michigan with the tragedy of Flint and the, and the water crisis there. Lead, of course, not only in our water, but in our air. Yeah. The main, uh, main source of lead is the combustion of leaded fuels. But of course, if you think about leaded fuels, you, you don't see leaded gasoline anymore when you went to fill up your, your car the other day. It was all unleaded because legislation has taken the lead out and replaced it with other things. But there's also lead pollution from other sources too. Lead pollution is particularly nasty. It causes nervous system damage. It can impact kidney function. And of course, the big problem with lead, which is why they kind of got rid of it in leaded paints and leaded gasoline, is because there is a distinct a correlation between exposure to lead and also uh, brain development. So that's why the Flint tragedy was, was so, uh, so bad on so many levels, but specifically for children. If your child is exposed to high concentrations of lead through air or water, then that can cause um, significantly lower IQs and learning difficulties and learning defects in, in children. Now, the last one is one that might, might not have heard of. Now, this one's not officially regulated by the EPA, but there are definitely World Health Organizations that are, uh, give limits. And this one's called particulate matter. And this is one that I've focused quite recently my research on. And this one's a really big deal because the exposure to particulate matter is a, a big area of emerging science. Now, these particulate matters, the, the tiny, tiny little particles of soot, when you burn fossil fuels or when you run a vehicle and you have brake dust comes out, if you ever looked at your rim of your of your car over a long period of time, it has like a black dust around the rim. That's brake dust, and that can actually go into the air and can be in, um, result in inhalation. Also, the combustion of fossil fuels results in large amounts of this particulate matter. Now, this tiny, tiny microscopic soot particles are not designed to be kept out of our lungs. Our lungs have evolved to kind of keep out things that are much larger. These are tiny, ultra-fine particles that breathe in, they go right down into the lung. And once they go in, they don't come out. And so you can have exposure over this over time, can see all kinds of potential human health impacts. Emerging science shows a link between high correlations of, of, of these degenerative illnesses and these nasty things that are, are happening to people's health with large concentrations of this particulate matter. So we have clusters of heart disease, lung cancer, things like COPD, where you have, you know, literally can't sort of clear your throat to, to breathe, lower respiratory infections, things like stroke, there's even evidence that uh, clusters of type 2 diabetes can be correlated to areas that have high concentrations of the particulates. Things like adverse birth outcomes. And finally, um, some really potentially interesting, perhaps game-changing areas of science. In 2019, um, the British medical journal The Lancet published a series of paper linking the neurological fiber tangles inside people's brains that have Parkinson's disease and other forms of dementia. Uh, 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 Alzheimer's disease, rather, and other forms of dementia seem to correlate with people who have been exposed over a lifetime to large concentrations of this particulate matter. So maybe there is this, certainly a, an area of emerging science, but there's definitely a, appears to be a link between these neurological problems that we seem to see, you know, exploding. I mean, as if you look at the, the statistics, more and more people are being diagnosed with these neuro, neurological degenerative diseases. It's a big problem, an exploding problem. Maybe it's related to other factors for sure, but there's definitely um, a, a link between high concentrations of this particulate matter and these neuro neurological problems. So how do we kind of tie this area of concern in terms of air pollution with this wonderful city that is so close to us, the city of Detroit? Well, I kind of want to tie those two together in my final part of my presentation where we'll look directly and focus on that 48217 zip code. And so I kind of put up a slide here um, of Detroit. And of course, there's the motto of Detroit. And I'm sure you're familiar with that. It says, you know, things uh, we will get better from the ashes. 
and so I think that that's such a great model for Detroit because it's a city that's undergone a lot of problems, but it's a city that's coming back. And we want to highlight the problems and potentially the coming back now of one particular zip code, the one that we're going to focus on, 48217. Before we do that, we need to kind of consider the city as a whole, though. What I have here is a color map, uh, which was uh, taken by some data from the Michigan Environmental uh, Project, which is um, some colleagues at the University of Michigan did. Don't worry about too much about the, the legend there on the graph. I just want you to get the colors. If you see a, a larger warm color, a red color, that means areas of Detroit that have been highlighted as being ones that have larger pollution. The cooler colors, the more yellows, those are the ones that have less pollution. So what, I, what you see there etched in black is the city boundary, the city of Detroit itself. And as you can see that Detroit is, for all intents and purposes, in the whole, holistically, it's a fairly polluted city, much like much of the cities that we have in the United States. That core area of, that we would class as sort of downtown or really the city of Detroit in Wayne County, that is the one that has highest pollution. The ones closer to the peripheries, the ones away from that kind of nexus, the pollution is less. But of course, that is a holistic approach to the entire city. When we start delving down, we see that, well, hotspots can be seen. And quite often, these hotspots are located adjacent to areas of these heavy industries. Also, what we have here drawn uh, from the Detroit Environmental Justice um, Organization is significant pollution sources in the city of Detroit. So you've got the Marathon Oil Refinery. You got the lime factory, you got the US Steel over in Ecorse, you got the EES Coke factory, you got US Steel in Zug Island, you got the River Rouge power plant. So Detroit is actually a fairly industrial city. You've got areas of residential um, neighborhoods, you've got areas that are um, more service like businesses, and then finally, you've got areas of heavy industry. And these are almost cheek by jowl in some places. So Detroit, when we look at it, is it's kind of notorious for this sort of, this, this mirroring of heavy industry and also people's communities. And what we've already seen is these heavy industries, they are regulated by the Clean Air Act, but they still emit large amounts of things like the particulate matter, things like nitrogen oxides. And also it's very interesting as we'll see later that Michigan is one of the few states that doesn't have any legislature by um, the, the, the house in the Senate in Michigan, then, that really kind of limits how close industry can be to, for example, schools. And so that's a big problem because we can see that Detroit has many neighborhoods and schools that really are pretty close. They're almost cheek by jowl, as I said, with these areas of heavy industry. About 69,000 Detroit residents live within 150 meters of a major freeway. And if you think of Detroit public schools, then these, these days are a little bit older now, but about you know, 24,000 students, uh, about 200 meters from a major major highway. So if people go into school, the kids in this in the school uh, playground at recess, they're all pretty close to areas of these heavy industries. Well, that's an interesting thing, but it's specifically very interesting for one particular area that we're going to look at for the remaining of our time today, that ZAB zip code. Here's a picture that a friend of mine took flying into Detroit. Now, if you're ever flying to Detroit, depending on where your airplane comes, then you can see the areas of Detroit. You kind of think of like, you know, your, your landmarks, you got I-94 and Woodward Avenue, but also there are other landmarks too, if you look for them. For example, here's some neighborhoods in Detroit that are in the 48197 zip code. You've got those neighborhoods, you can see people's houses, right next to it, you've got a big highway. Right next to that, you've got areas of heavy industry. So this kind of unique circumstance is really interesting in terms of, I guess, the communities that are forced to endure the pollution sources that are literally right at their neighborhood. So what, what we can do is, of course, now start highlighting them. Let's think about where 48217 is and let's map out, this is a figure that I found in Bloomberg Business Week that shows how close a lot of these areas of heavy industry are to this unique zip code. So this unique zip code, as we saw already, is kind of cut off because of geography, but also is ringed by areas of these heavy industries which moved in, in the 1950s, as we alluded to previously. So in the white dotted line, that is the 48217 zip code. And quite close to that, you've got a scrapyard, oil storage, chemical plant, salt pile, gypsum plant, power station, wastewater treatment plant, cement loading facility, a power station, and a metal shredding facility, all within about two miles of this area. What, what, what do you know about this community? 
Who are the people who live there? Who are the people who have to live next to these areas of heavy industry? Well, what we can do fortunately is we just have a census so we can actually really get relatively up-to-date data on this wonderful zip code. And when we look at it, then the population is small. It's only about 8,210 people, but it's heavily African-American. It's about 86% African-American and also suffers from a large amount of unemployment. It's, about, it's over twice the national average, it's about 10%. And it's a poor neighborhood. The average mean uh, income for the people who live there is about $34,000 a year. About 27% of that population is below the poverty line. When you look at the medium income, it's even less. It's about $29,000. And then even the schools in this area are, well, they're underachieved, shall we say. They're also heavily African-American. And when we look at the schools, about 93% of them have Black students, but they're related as poor. Now, I didn't know what poor meant, so I actually went to the, um, the Dep US uh, Department of Education and then went to the Michigan uh, Department of Education trying to get some idea what this number actually means. And so you can actually look it up and say all these data are available for us to look at now through the recent census. You can find it on the internet. You can see the data for yourself. And this neighborhood is really struggling in terms of education. If you look at their average math proficiency scores, it's about 12% from schools are meeting the, the, the proficiency. That's compared to Michigan, which is about 39%. For reading, only about 15% of students are meeting the grade, compared to about 49% of students nationwide or um, statewide. And when we look at how these schools stack up, they're rated one out of 10, which means that they're in the bottom 50% of Michigan public schools. So it's a poor neighborhood, it's a black neighborhood, and it's a neighborhood that's got a really good case for suffering from problems with environmental justice. Well, you might say to yourself, or a friend that might be listening in might say, well, why don't people just move? I mean, it doesn't seem like a very nice place to live. Why don't they move? Well, of course, we already saw they don't have the financial muscle to make a move. And also, when we look at the, the, the homes, then people don't want to live there. People can't move because they don't have the financial wherewithal, and people don't want to move in. So you, you're kind of stuck there. If we look at um, some statistics from... Um, uh, the Detroit Environmental Justice Organization, it's a little bit blurry. What we have is medium home sales in that zip code, and of course, the cost of what those houses will go for if you were to move in there. And so we can see after the, the kind of Great Recession, there was a spike in, in home prices, but they've remained flat for you know, the last sort of 10 years. They, these are a little bit older data now. An average home price is about $60,000. So the cheap houses, but even then, they can't sell them. If you look, uh, then generally there's usually about 40 to um, 50 houses available at any one moment in time through 2012. The number has gone down a little bit now, but as you can see, not many people are moving into this neighborhood. Not many people are moving out of this neighborhood. The people there are, for all intents and purposes, they're kind of trapped. Now, the reason why we should be concerned about the fact that, I guess, the, the people are trapped is the fact that right on their doorstep, we have the Marathon Oil Refinery. Marathon Petroleum Company uh, is located at 301 South 4th Street in Oakwood Heights, and the facility was opened in 1930. And as um, we, we talked about in the introduction, then the facility is expanded, and it runs the only petroleum refinery here in Michigan. It's got a capacity of about 140,000 barrels a day. It's about 540 employees, maybe a bit less now, but only a fraction of those actually do live in the 48217 zip code. And also, as we alluded to earlier, unlike 14 other states in the United States, Michigan, um, our, our legislative bodies don't legislate how close industry can be to things like a school or things like people's homes. There's nothing on the books to say, well, you have to be a certain distance away from people's homes. You can literally have cheek by jowl areas that have urban uh, industries butting up next to people's houses. For example, in this 48217 zip code, then the plant that we talk about, the Marathon uh, Petroleum Factory or Petroleum Plant, is only a quarter mile from people's houses. So I wanna, I wanna kind of give you a thought experiment. Let, let's picture the scene. Let's picture the scene as a nice, beautiful summer's afternoon. You might wanna sit on your porch or go and talk to your neighbor. Maybe the kids are doing a pickup basketball game. It's, it's beautiful. You wanna get out and maybe sit on your porch and just have a chance to have a glass of wine or a coffee with your neighbor. And this is the view from your porch. I mean, that's not a sight that I would relish enjoying with my neighbors if I was sitting there engaging them with conversation. 
my kids were playing basketball down at the local court, having this, this monstrosity right next to them, that wouldn't be something that I would uh, be very happy with either. So really we have a problem here where people are trapped in this community for reasons that we've talked about, and now they're exposed to the air pollution that this industry is uh, unfortunately bestowing upon them. Well, this plant is notorious. This is a notorious plant through the Michigan Department of Environmental Quality. It's in fact been cited many times as a history of problems in terms of its air pollution. Now the neighborhood, you go to and talk to any of the residents, they complain about some strange smells. They complain about things like a strange black dust that might be seen on their vehicles or on their porch. And also, as I say, the EPA knows all about the, uh, the violations that this plant has. It is permitted to pollute, but sometimes it goes beyond those permits as well. In, since uh, 2013 then, this plant has been cited through 13 violations, five of them requiring legal action because the EPA um, through the Division of Department of Environmental uh, Quality said that they were high priority cases. Now most of these involved, as I say, violations of the Clean Air Act, releasing large amounts of volatile organic uh, chemicals into the air, giving strange smells, causing the neighborhood uh, community to suffer uh, watering eyes, irritated um, breathing difficulties, I say that black dust that started mysteriously appearing on their vehicles. So Marathon themselves have often denied the allegations. They said, oh, it wasn't us, or oh, the wind was, was, was blowing in a strange way that the plume kind of blown over the community and then it kind of circled the around. They always had a few excuses for this. Sometimes they blamed uh, third party contractors, but they did actually sell. So in the three cases that you can see, um, in 2005, the Michigan Department of Environmental Quality, the MDEQ, has taken legal action against the plant in 2005, 2014, 2016, and the plant is settled each time. You can find the settlement agreements right there at that website. They're freely available. You can see what the complaint was, and of course, what the, um, the, the, the legislation that was uh, kind of, I guess, negotiated between the two parties. They then uh, resulted in a settlement that uh, can also is, is, is there freely available for you to look at, so you, should you desire. But of course, if you're, if you're someone who's trapped in this neighborhood, then you want your story to be known. You want your story to get out there. And of course, this zip code has now kind of entered our, our, certainly our lexicon by that, that moniker of Detroit or Michigan's most polluted zip code. And that's mainly due to the agitation and also the action and community action of the people who live there. And this story is picked up um, all the way back in 2012, but it was in 2016 that I became aware of it through a Newsweek article. You can see they put it right there on their front page. It says, Detroit makes you sick. They also followed up with another article in 2016 called Michigan's air pollution problem bigger than the Flint water crisis. NPR, uh, they also carried a story on their airwaves and also on their um, website that called, it was called Toxic Town, Detroit's most polluted zip code. Detroit Free Press has also run several articles about the zip code and even um, uh, the candidate for the Democratic nomination for president, Jay Inslee, when he was in the race, he came to, to Michigan to visit and to campaign, but he also made a point of his campaign was focused on the environmental movement, specifically regarding climate change. And so he made it a point when he did come to visit to Michigan to visit Detroit's most polluted zip code. Daily Cause website also had an article in 2020 calling Detroit's air pollution worse than we thought. And even internationally, Manchester Guardian in the United Kingdom, where I, where I was born, then they had a story in 2021 about the zip code, Detroit's most vulnerable residents face inequities of air quality and toxic air. So you can get the press on your side. You can kind of get um, people to come and do interviews. You can kind of try and make your case. And certainly agitating like this by the community is certainly something that you can do. And it can not only agitate in terms of making your case available and known to the press, but also, of course, we can uh, legislation is going to be the key here, perhaps. And so, kind of actively engaging through uh, the democratic process, our elected officials, be it mayor of Detroit, be it um, you know, the representatives of the people, be it um, the, you know, Senator Stabenow and Senator Peters, the people who represent uh, uh, those, those those communities in Congress and also in, in uh, Michigan as uh, House and Senate, then those people really need to kind of get an idea of what's going on in this community as well. Well, fortunately for this community in 2019, the House of Representatives heard the case of the people of 48217, where they really got a chance to air 
their grievances in terms of what this community has been dealing with in terms of their, their just environmental justice issues. Now, that uh, the representative for for A217 in the House is actually a representative Rashida Tlaib, a very famous member of Congress, um, very active in the, in the Democratic uh, Caucus, the progressive wing of the Democratic Party, member of the, the, the squad um, that uh, is really active in the progressive wing of the Democratic Party. And so she championed the case and brought hearings um, on the floor of Congress. So those persons that are, uh, are the community leaders of 48217 could come and talk. And also in conjunction with that, Right at the same time, the Michigan Department of Environmental Quality, now called the EGLE, um, were concluding a two-year study into measuring the air quality at this particular zip code. And so they were really interested in kind of hearing the people and then hearing what the science behind this is. And this was a collaboration, the science that is, through the EGLE, um, the Michigan Environmental Protection Agency, the Region 5, you have my colleagues at the University of Michigan, the Sierra Club, and also the New Mount Vernon Missionary Baptist Church. And you can find these data right there at that particular website, this michigan.gov and then the subsequent URL. So what did they find? What did the Michigan Department of Environmental Quality or the EGLE find when it published on the floor of, the, of Congress, the two year study into the air quality? Well, they found something that was very interesting. They found that air pollutants were below the screening level for non-cancer related protection. So these are things like SO2, lead and particulate matter. They said that those measurements were actually below the federal limits. Interesting. And when they measured for sulfuric acid, only two of 53 samples were above that screening level. Now for the pollutions, uh, the pollutants that cause cancer, then there are all the potential levels of concern, things like arsenic and naphthalene, hexavalent chromium, the one that made Aaron Brockovich very, uh, very famous with that legislation, well, those pollutants were almost never detected. Now, some of that was because they never actually look for them. And sometimes they were below the detection limits of the laboratory that they, they kind of you know, went and, and, and tested in the lab. They, they just couldn't measure them. And so they just concluded that the, the, those levels are, are not known. So that was an interesting result. Clearly, the people of 48217 were very disappointed with those results. And so immediately um, scientists started looking at the, the data and they started maybe identifying potentially at least some, some problems with the study. So Representative Tlaib all spoke out in terms of thinking about this doesn't seem to gel with what the community and the community organizers are reporting. The, the toxic smells, the burning eyes, the debris and dust they find on their cars. And so what someone like myself, um, if I was to, to look at this, then what I think is that now, these single emissions are probably not capturing all of the emissions. Now, the residents are, of course, looking at a hyper-local environment. And the Department of Environmental Quality is measuring at certain point sites, and they're trying to get an idea of, well, if I measure over here, that's going to be representative of what's going on down here. And when I measure over there, that's representative of what's going on down there. Now, the scientific literature shows that there are drawbacks with drawing that kind of conclusion. And so the fact that what they were measuring doesn't seem to gel with what the residents were claiming, it might be a problem with the fact that the way they're measuring. Now, often the Department of Environmental Quality measures in sites that look a lot like the one you can see in this picture. They have dedicated equipment, which costs many thousands of dollars at a remote site. That site then becomes a point source that you're trying to get an idea of what it is everywhere. Now, these are expensive equipment. They are um, hardcore analytical uh, chemistry is involving in, in making those measurements. They need to be isolated so you know, people don't go and mess with them. They need to be calibrated. They need to be, um, have their own power supplies. And so it's very expensive to have a large number of these all over the place. And that's why we only have these kind of point sources. Now, when we look at mapping those point sources relative to 48217, then yeah, I, I can see the fact that there might be some problems with these with the study. There was only a couple of monitors that actually produced the data that the Department of Environmental Quality used for their study. One was actually out of the zip code. It's in 48209. It's there, you can see the West Ford Street, uh, the former Southwest High School. There was a monitor right there. In conjunction, there's another one at the, the Mount Hermon New, uh, Baptist Church, which is in 48217. You see that green one down in the bottom left. But that's significantly away from where the refinery is. And the other one was much further north of the refinery, 
quite close to the River Rouge uh, uh, Ford Industrial Complex, but again, outside of the Apple zip code that we're focusing on here. So trying to say that those kind of a point over here and a point over there and a point over there is representative of what's going on in the hyper-local environment of 48217. Yeah, you, you might not be able to connect the dots there. Well, of course, this bad press and bad publicity did motivate the refinery itself. In December 2020, for example, $5 million was offered by the Marathon uh, refinery to buy up homes in that, that real close uh, proximity to the refinery to kind of create a, a more of a buffer zone. We talked about there's no legislation that allows this, but the refinery said, well, we want to do good by the community. We want to make sure we have a buffer zone. And so negotiating with the city of Detroit Land Bank Authority, they purchased 38 abandoned homes, 140 vacant lots, specifically in that area east of uh, I-75. Now the goal was to create this green space to suffer, uh, to, to kind of uh, serve as this buffer. And other pledges as well, they put $2 million into establishing things like a local rec center and supporting organizations in the area. So before I wrap up today, one couple of last things to talk about. First of all, of course, the community was very disappointed with this result. Community organizers are continuing to lead the fight for environmental justice that the residents feel that they're, they're, um, they, they deserve. Several advocacy groups have been formed. People are constantly telling their personal stories you know, to anyone who really will ask, the members of the media specifically. And of course, science is also working to understand this community better in terms of that hyper-local air quality. And for us, I think the take home is really twofold. One is in terms of community organization and perhaps public action. And the second one is in terms of science. So clearly I feel we need new measurements and better measurements in this, uh, this, this zip code. We need to coordinate on the, the local level with those point sources where the Michigan Department of Environmental Quality have those, uh, the, those sensors. Then perhaps we need to establish kind of a much more of a community sensor network. This is where work like um, the one I'm doing in my research group might be able to uh, help with that. New sensors that are coming online will provide perhaps the opportunity to measure much more frequently and a much more hyper-local kind, of, uh, kind of area, especially over 48217. Now, recently there's been a groundswell of so-called citizen scientists, people who are concerned about their air quality maybe at their home. And so you can buy online now a sensor that will tell you the concentration of ozone, concentration of nitrogen dioxides, concentrations of particulate matter, and you can buy these for just a couple hundred dollars. So if you're looking for that perfect gift for that, uh, that loved one at Christmas time, the holidays are coming, maybe you're thinking about it, maybe buy them an air quality sensor. I have one in my house. And these technologies are using the new next generation of things like the Internet of Things, where more and more devices are connecting through wireless and, um, and cellular networks where we can have devices that are talking now to the internet. And we can place these devices strategically and make measurements. And what we see is these devices are often low power and they're a lot cheaper than those traditional methodologies. But with some work, my group's done a lot of this work um, in this area, you can kind of use these single board computers like Raspberry Pi and Arduino to kind of couple with these sensors. You can see there, you've got one that's kind of the size of a quarter. Compare that to like a big old suitcase thing that I used to use when I was when I was first starting off. So maybe what we can do is imply a large number of these guys. For example, you can see here a list, a table that these guys are now available. You can search it up on your favorite search engine. You can ask your, your friends and your family to buy you one. They can go on uh, Amazon.com. I probably don't want to go there. Don't give Jeff Bezos any more money. He'll just go to space again. Your favorite uh, local... Uh, um, vendor will be able to have to furnish you with these one of these guys and they can go on your home and they can measure the air quality right there on your own home. Now, if you can measure it right there on your home, what's to say we couldn't have a dozen of these spread over the, um, the, the community at 48217? What's stopping us from having a, a very large distribution of these, these, these small sensors that can go on people's houses, they can talk to cell networks, they can talk to the the Wi-Fi that people have in their homes, and then they can develop kind of like a, a really hyper-local air quality map of environments like this zip code. Perhaps that will get an idea of what really is going on in this area. So we see here some residents who have got this and various other um, projects that are going on. They're pretty small, they're pretty lightweight. You can plug them in, you can set them up there in the eave of your roof, and they measure, they talk to the internet, all the data are available to scientists like myself, and we can get our hands on it 
and then figure out what's going on. Finally, of course, what you can guys can do, well, of course, as a scientist, I can do my part, but all of us as citizens, concerned citizens can do community action. We can collaborate with the communities. We wanna make sure that they can fight for their own right to health and safety. We can partner with researchers. You can have people like myself come in and present to you guys. You can then go and tell your friends. You can have them, have other people who are interested in this work from different aspects come in and educate the public. We can lead the way. We can be creative. We can be innovators. We can be dynamic legislators that kind of go to um, either our existing representation or maybe run for office, maybe run for the school board, maybe run and say, I'm really concerned about the air quality near the school. What can I do? Well, maybe I can get one of these sensors and put it next to the school, find out what's going on in this, this school community, something like that. We can do things that you guys are already doing. We can do workshops, we can do brown bag seminars, we can do tours, we can show how these communities are suffering through uh, issues of environmental justice. And finally, of course, we can train the local workforce. We can train the next generation of scientists and citizens who are thinking already about uh, community action, environmental justice, and making a community that's better for everyone. And so these are the focuses that I hopefully, uh, you guys can also uh, bring to the table in conjunction with someone like myself who is no more of a scientist. One last thing, folks. I wanna give the last word in my presentation today to someone who actually lives at that zip code. Now, Teresa Landrum is an activist and a member of uh, Governor Whitmer's Michigan Advisory Council for Environmental Justice. And she lives in 48217, has been a really vocal advocate for the, that community. And so she was asked in an interview uh, relatively recently about how she feels about giving the moniker of Detroit's most polluted zip code to 48217. Did you think that's been a problem? And she said, it's actually helped not hurt the community. And so last word I'd like to give to Teresa. And she says, I think, it helped bring attention to the area's problems. If that tagline would not come about, I don't think the environmental adjustments movement would be what it is today. Thank you so much for your attention today, guys. It's been my pleasure to present to you. Happy to stay online for a couple more minutes and have any questions you might, uh, might have. So thank you so much, appreciate it. Well, thank you very much, Gavin. This was a great presentation. And I know the last thing you discussed there with the, all those little gadgets that are available now online for us to measure our own air quality. I know as soon as I tell my husband uh, about this, he's going to want one of his own. He's a little bit geeky himself. So I think that's really useful. I, and you know, you really answered a question that I had because ProPublica recently published, a, 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 you've probably seen it, you know, they published a whole article about toxic air and everything. And I was so excited when I saw it and I went and put in 48217 and it was like, it didn't even appear. And yeah, yeah, it's, it's really you interesting. Know, I was tempted and maybe I will now after having seen this presentation or, or sending them an email and saying, you know, this is wrong. I mean, you know, uh, this is wrong. But we do have a link to that ProPublica article, which I actually do recommend to people. It's quite um, sobering. One of the questions I had is if you had a magic wand and you could shut down the, all the industry that was polluting 48217 right now, how long would it take for the effects to be minimized. I mean, you know, in other words, like the soil and everything is polluted from particulates um, precipitating all over everything. What more realistic question is, you know, what would it really take? What is realistically required to clean it up? Yeah, soil is a little bit out of my, my purview, but um, yeah, the atmosphere and the earth has a wonderful ability to, to clean itself. And so there are natural cycles that, um, that kind of take care of us in the Earth's atmosphere through chemistry, where you have a, a, a gas which is toxic to human health is actually broken down um, in the atmosphere through natural processes. Now, of course, the humans have put a bit, our big thumb on the scale and really kind of overloaded that, that perhaps natural system. But the Earth will you know, does recover relatively quickly. And for soils that have uh, material like heavy metals and things like that, um, things like the, 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 the hexavalent chromium, which is a big problem in water pollution. And even here in, in for example, in the Ann Arbor area, we all know about the dioxin plume mm. that um, you know, is, is, is a legacy of, of heavy industry from, you know, from, from decades ago, still causing problems. So um, yeah, so the, the air will recover very, very quickly. But then if, if they were, I did have a big switch, I had a big lever and I was able to, to turn everything off within um, a, a few days or even a month, then, um, then that, 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 that air quality would be significantly improved. 
Um, for soluble water, where you have more longer lived species, it would be more difficult. As I say, I'm not really sure because it's just outside of my, my area of mm -hmm. expertise how long uh, it would take soils and things to recover. But um, yeah, I mean, sometimes it can be very fast depending on the chemistry that's occurring there, but sometimes it can be decades as we've seen from the, from the Gelman plume in here in Ann Arbor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, um, another question I had was you, well, actually it's more of a comment. You know, it's interesting that uh, when, when we learned that you would um, be speaking with us and I was doing my research on it, the, the Google searches that I did did not really turn up very many articles. It was, you know, it's like there isn't enough interest in it, you know, so I kept searching <laughs> over and over again. So hopefully raising that uh, on Google's, uh, you know, um, search engine optimization. But do you, I mean, it seems like it's getting more uh, more publicity now. Like as you pointed out, there was the you know the Guardian article and and that and the, that sort of thing. What about your own work? I mean, have you um, seen more interest in your publications and in your research and so forth? Yeah, it's it's interesting. Um, uh, actually, uh, what was it last? When, when was the I don't the um, the just about a week ago. Um, I actually put in um, an application for funding through um, a grant that I wrote um, to do the kind of work that we, we, we alluded to where we're looking to expand our understanding of these, these microsensors. And the idea would be um, for, from a, a related project. And then my hope would be if it was funded and then to use that sort of um, that small network that we hope to develop um, to get some publications out of that. And then also use that as a, as a proof of concept where we can then ask for more money from a larger funding organization such as the National Science Foundation or National Institute of Health. My idea would be then to develop one of these really large scale uh, hyper, net, hyper local sensor networks where you know, and it would be a dream to have every house or every other house in this community measuring these, these molecules because there does appear to be a disconnect between you know, the testimony of uh, the people who live there who are you know, experiencing this 24 seven, 365 compared to the data that were produced in that two-year study. As I said, I was really interested in reading that study myself. And I was, I say I was shocked. I was certainly surprised that they, they seem to see such lower levels because it just doesn't gel with what the community is telling us. And, you know, of course you want to be, you want to be um, objective and you want to base your arguments on science and data. But when the community as a whole is saying, look, we're, we're subjected to these strange clouds that are appearing, our throats are burning, our eyes are streaming something's coming out of there and then people are saying, no, no, we don't see any evidence from it, then there's a disconnect there. So I think mm -hmm. that definitely um, focusing on the environmental justice um, cases that the, 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 the residents are, are, have brought to our attention, both nationally in the media and continually to do so by the community action and, and constant legislative uh, pestering of our, of our various institutions, then um, you know, that, that's something that can, only good can come of it. We clearly need more mm -hmm. data here and so there appears to be this disconnect. Let, let's close that gap. Let's use science and perhaps a new type of science or a new mode of thinking where we can close the gap between those testimonies and then the real numbers that we're seeing there. Yeah, you know, I mean, I was thinking when you, again, when you were talking about these little, you know, the, the, the uh, smaller, you know, that, that, what am I trying to say here? The, you know, sort of the shrinking uh, equipment, yeah. you know, so that now you can put it in your pocket or, you know, whatever. And um, I was thinking that, you know, how we say that, you know, even though we're talking about 48217, which is, you know, over there in Detroit, it, the air in our communities, you know, is also, um, you know, we have to be concerned about that. And so I was wondering, are there places where people are actually buying this sort of equipment and setting up, uh, you know, setting up citizen scientist monitoring, um, you know, networks? Is that is that going on? Yeah, the, fortunately, there is. I mean, in I mean, I've only been interested in this in the, in the last sort of five or six years, but I've seen this big transition where um, I started hearing about and, and reading the literature about these new sensors that were coming online and a lot of scientists would be, well, that can't be any good. And so they started doing um, sort of lab, lab studies where you measure one of these new sensors and, and side by side with more traditional techniques. Because with anything you think of like the new iPhone that comes out, right, you want to do it as good a job as like the iPhone 8, even though it's the iPhone 12 or whatever it is. So we want to do as good a job, if not better. And so by, we can do better by cheaper, faster and more power. 
but you still want to have the resolution and the limits of detection, all the things that a scientist worries about. And so what we've seen is that they seem to be getting better. And certainly for, for some things, for example, particulate matter, then for $250, you can go to you know, uh, um, the website and you can, you can buy one yourself. And as I say, I have one in my, my house and they've been shown through um, uh, scientific studies to be as good as the existing monitors that um, you know, more traditional scientists would employ. So, you know, if they're as good as, but they offer these advantages, then, you know, we, we, can, we can do that. So you, you have the cost or drop the cost by a factor of 10 in some cases, and is as good as before in terms of the, the things it can do, that opens up a, um, you know, a, a large amount of uh, opportunity for someone like myself or another person, even if you're a citizen scientist, to just kind of put that on your house and send your data to the web. And then people like me or other concerned parties um, like yourself or, you know, and, and your colleagues here, you can look at that at any one moment in time. So say, what's the air quality today in Texas? What's the air quality today in mm -hmm. Los Angeles? And you've got a large amount of network that you can, you can go in there and look at. Um, I think that there might be a question or two in the chat. Um, Mary. Yeah, I see, uh, I see um, Vicky's got one. Yeah, yeah. Uh, go ahead. Um, I'll just read that if those of you don't have the chat open. It says, um, I found shocking to learn there's only one oil refinery in the entire state of Michigan with the Flint water crisis is reported as a peer edition reported high levels of children. Yes, that finally caught the government's attention. Has there been any medical studies um, pointing out any negative trend lines for people in 48217? That's a really good question. Um, yeah, I think, I think again, there's, there's tangential evidence. I think that they um, have higher risks of um, various respiratory ailments. Now with that, then there's always the decoupling that has to occur. So for example, um, one of the big problems, certainly with like particulate pollution, is they can cause damage to the lungs. But when you have a community who's um, generally, you know, is a poor community, generally they have lower quality of health anyway because of you no know, availability of healthcare, the quality of life in terms of the diet. So it's difficult to kind of tease out all of the things. So for example, oh, there's high COPD in 48217, but more than average number of the residents there smoke cigarettes, and so they know there's the direct mm. causation between smoking and COPD. So how much of it is mm. one thing and then the other? So that's mm -hmm. what we need is, as you alluded to, you know, something where you can see that there's only one thing that's definitely uh, co-located with these emission sources that might show that, that that spike that those residents are subjected to. I don't know of anything um, off the top of my head thinking about it now that, that does show that, that distinct correlation. There is anecdotal evidence, but but anecdotal evidence, you always want to be, you know, you might be on shaky ground there. So um, we, we, we do want to make maybe an inference, but not necessarily say a cause and effect. I thank you so much. And I, I was so interested the you know, kind of the history. I remember more of that history than I like to, <laughs> to like to admit, but um, it was, uh, you know, really, you know, to end us up here at what's happening in 48217 and what's happening in so many of the, um, you know, polluted cities around the nation. It, it was, uh, I found it very moving and very inspiring the work that you're doing, you know, to try and um, show us that, show everybody that and, um, and inspire us to action. So um, with that. Uh, oh, I, did, I did have one other question here. So Gavin, with the new infrastructure bill, which is gonna promote supposedly green, clean energy, how do you think that would affect those folks in 48127? Is it going to have much of an impact on them? Or is that change going to be so slow that it's just not going to matter? Um, that's a great question once again. Um, yeah, I mean, of course, any anytime you're transitioning from uh, fossil fuel-based infrastructure to one of clean energy, then that's going to benefit everyone. And so um, the, the difference and the difficulty is then often those are, are slow and it's a slow transition. So for example, the, 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 the bill that you, you just alluded to, then of course, there's a lot of money to develop clean energy rather than close down existing ones. So we won't build any more coal power plants because we've got the money now for renewable energy, but there's, that only goes so far, right? Because you, you have to build a new infrastructure, but then you have to close down the old ones. And so it's the closing down bit that's gonna be the more important thing. Yeah, you can you can have this transition where you know shift from one one modality to the other in terms of the generation. That will definitely be useful and definitely will will benefit you know uh, society in in so many ways. But it's going to be a slow transition. So if you're dealing with you know the day to day 
struggles that those folks are doing, I, I, I think it will probably be perhaps 10, 15, 20 years, great, but you know, two, three, yeah. four months, that's probably mm -hmm. not going to be a, a significant change in terms of their, their quality of life that they, 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 uh, they have there. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. It was a great presentation. I learned a lot. Yeah. Oh, yeah. my pleasure. Th thanks for the invitation, Vicky. Yeah, really, as I say, thanks for reaching out to uh, to, to even uh, kind of put it on my radar for, for something that well, we we could uh, maybe do. So, uh, great, great, th th great to see you. And uh, as I say, it's uh, appreciated very much. All right. Well, thank you so much for your time, Gavin. And um, good luck with your grant applications. <laughs> and yeah, as uh, I say, it was uh, it was it was interesting that uh, it was on the tenth. Uh, um, that uh, I just put this. It's a it's a small seed seed grant, and so as I say, hopefully that'll be I'll be uh, once it once I do get those those funds, we can use that to to jump to kind of jump on to this next level. And actually, in the application, I did mention um, the environmental justice issues that our uh, you know our friends in Detroit are, are struggling with, and so hopefully that uh, that could be something that we we can go and look at um, in the next coming years. Good, yeah. Again, good luck, and thank you. Oh, it's my pleasure. As I say, I'm just so so glad and and so uh, that I could come and talk to you. You're so nice, and I uh, appreciate all the the, the introduction. And um, just uh, it was my pleasure to to share my my Friday afternoon with you. Good luck in the future, and as I say, every success to you and your and um, your organization. I know you're doing great work, so uh, I really appreciate the, the chance to come and talk to you today. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Goodbye now. Thank you for joining us today. We'll post links for a deeper dive into this topic in the chat and also on our website, lwbwashtenaw.org. We remind you that a recording of this meeting will be posted on our YouTube channel. We hope you will join us in December as we hold the last presentations in our climate justice series. On Wednesday, December 8th at our next Brews and Views presentation, Recycling and the Circular Economy, Teresa Reed will host Ecology Center Director Mike Garfield. On Friday, December 17th, our next Lunch and Learn presentation will be Protecting Our Watershed, Keeping Our Rivers Clean and Healthy with Chris Olson and Janet Cahan of the Huron River Watershed Council and Diana Kern of the Legacy Land Conservancy. Shout out to the three members of the League's Environmental Advocacy Advocacy Group, Sandra Sorin, Sorini Elser, Vicki Paulison, and Kathy Weinemann for their essential help in putting this series together. We would like to thank current members of the League of Women Voters for your support. If you're not yet a member, consider joining the League to support the essential work of protecting the right of every citizen to vote. Check out our website, lwvwashtenaw.org for how to join. Stay safe, stay well, and stay informed and active in your government. Thank you.